Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Blavatnik School. We are delighted to have Professor Stephen Vogel of the University of California at Berkeley here with us today to talk about his new book, Market Craft. Uh, I think it's an excellent book because it cites my own book. But um, no, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of wonderful things to say about the, the book, which uh, hopefully we'll get to in the Q&A. But the part that I found particularly insightful about this book is um, the idea or the implication that the, uh, that the thesis of market craft has for public policy education. And here at the Blavatnik School, as we're training uh, future leaders for uh, governments across the world, the idea that there are lessons to be learned from the state of market craft for uh, public policy education is something I hope we can all take away from this exercise. Uh, professor Vogel is the Han New Professor of Asian Studies and a Professor of Political Science at Berkeley. He has, uh, his previous books include Japan Remodeled, How Government and Industry Are Reforming Japanese Capitalism, and Freer Markets, More Rules, Regulatory Reform in Advanced Industrial Countries. Um, this, uh, I believe, is his third book. And uh, so we're delighted to welcome him here. Professor Vogel will speak uh, uninterrupted for about uh, uh, 30 minutes, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. And uh, so as, do prepare your questions. Uh, there will be a mic that goes around just because this event is being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, so before you ask your question, you'll have to wait for the mic to come around. Uh, and then uh, there are flyers available if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book. It's over there. There are also a few limited copies of the book available for purchase tonight um, for those of you who are interested. Fantastic. Take it away, Steve. Thank you, Karthik, for that gracious introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I actually first met Karthik at a panel about his book, um, and then I went on to, uh, to actually read it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot about um, accounting, which it turns out is a core element of market craft. So we'll get to that. Um, I uh, came to Britain quite a long time ago to work on my dissertation. The first book, Freer Markets, More Rules, was about Britain and Japan. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of the, still, to all of the scholars and the practitioners who helped me understand uh, British regulatory reform back in the 1980s, which was the period I was studying. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, it's great to be back. I mean, there actually is a thread from that earlier project to this one, and I'll get back to that point um, a bit later. So the the book begins with a pretty simple premise, which is that markets are institutions that are embedded in particular laws, regulations, practices, and norms. Now, you all know that, of course, already. Um, and many of the subfields of political economy actually build on that very premise, whether it be institutional economics, economic sociology, comparative political economy, the regulation school. They all agree that markets are institutions, that they're not natural, that they're constructed by us, people. Um, so the, my core thesis, um, which I will then develop, right, is that markets require governance. Right? It's not accidental. And not only to protect us, man and nature, from the collateral damage of the marketplace, right, the evils of the market, but also, maybe even more fundamentally, to function and to flourish in the first place. Right? And so in presenting the argument, I focus primarily on market governance, and I'm going to make a distinction between that and social regulation. So social regulation would be health, safety, environment. And I think it's kind of more obvious that we need to regulate ourselves, the markets, in terms of social regulation, right? There needs to be some regulation in terms of uh, occupational hazards, risks, health and safety, environment. It may be less obvious, at least maybe not to this audience, but to the world out there, that markets require governance and regulation in order to thrive in the first place. Um, and just in case it's obscure what I'm talking about when I say market craft, I'm just referring, that's just my own language for market governance, right? Um, I prefer governance to regulation, as you'll see, because I don't just mean governance by government. It could be also by private sector organizations as well. Um, but just to be concrete for a moment, 
what are we talking about? We're talking about accounting, for example, um, or corporate governance, labor market uh, regulation, antitrust, sector-specific regulation, intellectual property rights. In other words, the kind of the in institutional infrastructure that makes markets work. So today, I don't really want to go into the details of each of those topics, although I'm happy to address them in questions. Rather, I want to kind of lay out the general argument and also address how it applies to the policy world. Um, so if we start with the idea that markets are institutions, I would argue that if you move in a kind of a logical sequence, we go to some rel relatively banal assertions, like that markets are institutions, to ones that are maybe less obvious and more important for, 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 for my critique kind of the conventional wisdom and my attempts to offer something else, right? And so this is the sequence. In the book, I've got 10 points. I boil them down to five, but I tried to keep the five most important ones. Um, so if we just work our, well, our, our, ourselves logically, right? We think, okay, if markets are institutions, that means they're always governed. That means they're never ungoverned, right? So therefore, there are no free markets, right? At least in the sense of markets that are not governed, right? Um, and so the very language with, that we tend to describe the marketplace, right, the language of the free market actually is, uh, uh, has a contradiction built into it, right? Because markets are not free. Second point flows directly from that, so they have to be built, they have to be constructed, they are human constructs. That means that we have to build them. Okay, so as we go from the first two points, the three, four, and five, I think we go from the more obvious to the less obvious, and also the more uh, important, I think, for trying to understand current policy debates. So I'm going to spend a little more time on them. Um, and I want to start with three, and then we'll go to these two great false dichotomies of regulation versus competition and government versus market. So this is the way I want to think about gov uh, market reform. And what I'm doing in this table is I'm saying that there's kind of like two worldviews, right? Obviously, these are ideal types, but just to kind of give us a starting point, right? In one view, we define market reform as a process of removing barriers, right? In other words, you think, well, there's the market, right? And you think about all those things that are getting in its way, like all those terrible government regulations, and if we can finally get rid of them, then we will have arrived at the holy grail of the free market. The other view is that market reform is not really about stripping away obstacles. It's about building an infrastructure, right? So these are kind of two fundamentally different conceptions about what it takes to marketize, right? Or, right? So with respect to this dichotomy, and then I go through different parts of the world, post-communist transition, development, industrial countries, right? So what am I trying to say? Uh, I'm going to try to boil it down to five points. First is that this debate, while obviously a simplification, gets at the heart of some of the biggest and most important policy debates in the world, right? I mean, if you think about what's the nature of post-communist transition, is it shock therapy or is it gradualism, right? Washington consensus for a more versus a more institutional, right? At the heart of those are contrasting conceptions about what market reform means, right? Second point is that these debates involve both diagnosis and prescription, right? In other words, each worldview, what I call the market liberal view versus the market institutionalist view, right, has a particular notion of what the problem is and also what the solution is, right? For example, if we're looking at post-communist transition, what's the problem? The problem is the plan, right? The answer is destroy the plan, right? The problem is state ownership. Get rid of state ownership, right? If you just, it's a destructive process rather than a, the constructive one, right? Get rid of the plan, you will have the market, right? The other conception is no, you have to build the institutional infrastructure to stay in markets, right? Um, <clears throat> similarly with development, right? Diagnosis, these countries are dirigiste, right? Their governments are doing too much. Tell them to stop it, and then we'll have real capitalism. Versus, no, the governments are not uh, doing too much, they're doing too little, they're not too strong, they're too weak. 
they need greater administrative capacity so that they can regulate modern market systems. Um, <clears throat> third point is that the language that we normally use to describe these processes, notice I've said market reform, I haven't been talking about liberalization, that's a conscious choice because if you think about the language that we usually use for market reform, privatization, liberalization, deregulation, the very language implies that we're operating on the market liberal side. Does that make sense, right? The, those, those are words that, uh, that connote a stripping of intervention, right? And that if you got rid of it, then you would have the free market, right? So I'm saying that part of our conceptual confusion is grounded in the language that we use. But there's a twist, right? Which is that if we pick the first two, post-communist transition and development, the institutionalists are winning. It wasn't an easy battle. This is after several decades of battle, both intellectual battle and real world battle, at enormous human cost. Right? Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to argue, just to be provocative for a moment, that if we recast the market craft or market governance as a core function of government, then it begs the question, did we really have to spend several decades figuring this out, right? Shouldn't it have been obvious that market reform is a constructive process of building institutions, not one where you just strip away enough things and then you get to the market? Final irony here is that we understand this right best when it comes to post-communist transition, when it comes to development, and we understand it worst when it comes to ourselves, right? The advanced industrial world, right? I think there's actually a logical reason for that, which is that market institutions are, as a whole, better developed in the advanced industrial world. So we tend to think, well, okay, maybe we finally realize that, you, you know, you need some institutional building in the post-communist world, you might need a development, but we've got lots of regulation, we need to deregulate. And what I'm going to argue to you is that market reform is a process of constructing market institutions, that that is no less true for the advanced industrial world than it is for the developing world or the post-communist world. Um, and so that market reform is not deregulation, um, even in the industrial world. Um, so before I go on with my two dichotomies, I just want to try to kind of come at the same point from a slightly different angle which is that if you think about basic economics or basic political economy course, um, typically, obviously not here, of course, but typically it's, uh, it's presented as a juxtaposition of free trade versus protection, right? It goes back to Adam Smith, right? Those are your choices. So that's the lower right-hand box would be free trade. Um, and the upper left would be protectionism, right? And if you move from protection to free markets, that's liberalization. Right? And so it's, that's with respect to the international economy. If we look at the domestic economy, typically we would say you've got regulation, and then as you liberalize, you move towards competition. So that's kind of that arrow between the two gray squares. And I'm not arguing that that is not real. Right? What I'm arguing is that it's missing a second dimension, which was that of market development, right? where the relationship between government and market development is much more positive and, and not negative. And again, just to repeat my earlier point, I think we finally figured that out with respect to post-communist transition and development, but we haven't figured it out with respect to ourselves. <clears throat> so these are my false dichotomies, and this image is sort of my attempt at sort of showing you right, um, that you've got these kind of dichotomies of government right, versus market, regulation versus competition, constraint versus freedom or initiative, right? And I'm arguing that all of those dichotomies are false, and then in fact they get in the way of our understanding the relationship between government and market. So let's talk about deregulation. Um, since that was the topic of my first book, and that's kind of the, the link between that first project and this project, what I discovered after several years of research is I figured out that deregulation never happened, right? 
It got talked about, but it never happened, not in a literal sense. I'm not saying reforms didn't happen, but I'm saying that they were reforms of re-regulation, not reforms of deregulation, right? If you think about the language again, the way that we normally think of deregulation, the conventional usage implies that you are reducing regulation and thereby enhancing competition, right? You're getting those regulations out of the way so that we can all compete. And again, I'm not saying that that's an impossibility. I'm, there are real cases, right? So just to preempt some questions here. Um, <clears throat> There are real cases of real deregulation where you get rid of a rule and you actually enhance competition, right? But I am saying that that's relatively rare, that the dominant trend is one of freer markets and more rules. In other words, more regulation and more competition. And that that's not an accident because in most areas, you actually need more regulation to get more competition. After all, Adam Smith taught us, right? that if you get a bunch of business people together, they would rather collude than compete. So somebody's got to make them compete. So I think I could talk about this all day, but I won't. Um, but I, it's most intuitive, I think, in a, if you think about a utility sector, right? So you have, a, you have British Telecom, right, a public monopoly. You want to privatize it. You want to have competition. If you want to have competition, you've got to create competition, right? If you just said, okay, as of today, Right? We're going to privatize, liberalize. Anybody who wants to compete, go ahead. What would happen? Nothing. Right? The, the government actively had to stoke um, competition, and that meant a lot more regulation, not less. The same is true of government versus market, so I won't belabor the point. But again, I'm trying to make the same point as I am with um, deregulation versus competition, that government versus market, right? that very frame, that's how we frame many economic policy debates. right? Certainly in the United States, right? That's what the normal language we use. We say, okay, do we want the government or do we want the market? And again, I'm not saying there isn't any tension between the two. So, this, so I'm not saying that one of these lines is true and the other is false. They, they, they both exist, right? In other words, there are things that the government does that constrain markets. And there are things that governments do to empower markets, right? But we are caught up, right, in the assumption that the government is about constraining markets and not about empowering them. And I would argue that actually the dominant relationship is positive, not negative. So let's talk about policy. That's why we're here, right? Um, I'm suggesting that we should think of market craft as a core function of government, like statecraft. Right? This is a big deal, right? And just because the title has craft in it doesn't mean it's always done craftily, right? Um, so I'm not saying governments always get this right. It can produce spectacular success, and it can produce devastating failure. And no better examples to think about that than the information revolution and the financial crisis. Right? If we think about what is the greatest success story right, in the market realm of the past several decades, that would be the information revolution. What would be the greatest success story? The financial crisis. And I'm suggesting that they are both the product of market craft. So that gives you a sense of the scale right, of just how big the stakes are. Right? If you get it right, huge payoff. If you don't, great pain. Um, and I'm arguing that both of these are rooted in market craft, i.e., um, they didn't just happen by the market working on itself. It has to do with how, they, how those markets were crafted, um, and particularly had to do with the US government. In the information revolution case, um, there's a very nice book by Marina Mazzucato who makes this argument very poignantly, but basically that we think of the internet as the Wild West and Silicon Valley as the ultimate uh, embodiment of the entrepreneurial spirit, but actually the government created the foundations, right? The government spent money on R&D, um, government military procurement. The government, the military, the US military created the internet in the most literal sense, right? In creating the original network. Silicon Valley is not a free-for-all. It's a very distinctive institutional framework right? that also was critical to the development of the information revolution as we know it in terms of, of fueling many of the innovations. Perhaps less obvious is antitrust policy, American antitrust policy. But if you think about what would have happened if we had let IBM, let's say, and AT&T continue to dominate this sector in a kind of a top-down way, right? 
antitrust policy prevented that. That's what allowed the breakup of the value chain, the rise of uh, downstream industries like Microsoft um, and software or Intel in, in um, components, right, in chips, right? And that's what allowed for the kind of the bottom-up innovative model, um, you know, the open innovation model of the IT era. And finally, telecommunications reform was also important in bringing down costs, right? Because just imagine if you still had to pay per minute uh, for your use of the internet, right? That would not only be inconvenient and costly, it would also affect what kinds of products and applications uh, we would have, and our world would be a very different one. The financial crisis, obviously the opposite. Now this is an incredibly complicated story, and I'm sure you'll all be delighted that I'm not gonna go into all the details. Um, but what I am trying to suggest is that you can kind of boil down all that complexity to a massive failure of market craft, right? And especially, not only, but especially US, right? The American authorities gave financial institutions uh, greater freedom to take risks without commensurate, right, kind of matching strengthening of regulation and supervision. They failed to regulate derivatives. They didn't understand or didn't address um, the incredible misaligned incentives in the U.S. mortgage finance market. Um, and finally, they put too much faith in market players. So before I go on, I just want to note that I don't think that the difference between these two cases is accidental. That if we say, for example, I said market craft can be good or it can be really bad, right? If we try to ask the question, does the U.S. government, right? This is kind of a tough question to ask today, but anyway, I'll say it anyway. Does it have the capacity, right? To, you know, to enact and implement a good market craft strategy? And my answer would be that the answer is not one of uniformity, but a variation, right? In other words, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I just gave you an example, a, po a positive and a negative example, and what I'm trying to say right now is that it's not random, right? That in the former case, you had greater administrative capacity. You also had less uh, maybe a greater appreciation for what I call market craft or less ideological blinders. And finally, maybe most importantly, your, the, the authorities were less captured, right? In the finance case, they were more captured by the finance industry, so it's, less, it's not totally surprising that things didn't go so well. Um, so who says? Well, I would argue, for example, Alan Greenspan says. This is the famous um, congressional hearing where he basically came clean and confessed. Um, and I won't read you uh, the entire text, but Sherman Waxman is pushing him and saying, you had an ideology that led you to make these mistakes, right? And some of you probably know that Greenspan is a great fan of Ayn Rand, right? Kind of a libertarian ideology. Um, he thinks that markets do good and governments do bad. Um, and so Waxman says, that's behind the errors that you made, right? As the chiefs are of the world economy. And Greenspan says, what I am saying to you, sir, is yes, I found a flaw. Okay, now here's where I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I do wanna give you a sense of the kind of the range of cases that I look at in kind of the middle part of the book. Um, telecoms, net neutrality, antitrust, intellectual property rights, um, electricity markets, and I also go into the Japanese case um, and, uh, but just for fun, let me pick out two uh, to talk about briefly to kind of give you a sense. But what I'm trying to do in this table um, and in the final chapter of the book is to link these conceptual issues, right? Right, this, the dominance of the two specific policy area, errors, right? So what I'm saying is that this is not just random misunderstanding that there's real damage and real cost in terms of policy. Um, so I'm going to talk about the top one because it's the one that deals with Britain in my research several decades ago. Um, the telecoms reform in Britain, right, that opened up uh, the market to competition or exposed BT to competition um, was in partly inspired by a report by Stephen Littlechild that came out in 1983. Um, and it argued for a duopoly strategy. The idea was that BT was so big and so dominant that instead of letting a bunch of minnows in, they would all eat up each other, right? We should have one big competitor so that that competitor would have a chance against BT. 
But the driving concept of the whole thing was, it was kind of like um, you know, the Leninist withering way of the state, right? which is that once we got competition, we'd be done. Right? That was the idea. Right? So we, we kind of have to rig this market just to, get, just to kind of start the engine, get some competition, and then regulation can disappear. And what I'm arguing is that if we had a market craft vision, right, it shouldn't have taken this long to figure out that that was never going to happen. Um, and I'm not picking on the Brits because it's exactly the same thing for, for not all, but some Americans, some Japanese officials will make the same argument, which is that as soon as we get this right, we can all go home, all right? And the market will take over from there. And I'm arguing that, that given, right, the nature of this industry, um, the need, you know, the, the, the technology changes, the market dynamics change, but the need for governance never disappears. Um, another example, now let's go to Japan. Um, this is where I've got overestimating the benefits of deregulation about two-thirds of the way down. The Japanese have tried to emulate American and British deregulation. Right? And in the process, they made lots of mistakes, but I'm going to just talk about two. Right? The first is what's the nature of deregulation. Right? Um, and to their credit, I think the Japanese authorities actually understand this better than the Americans or the British. So I'll give them a little credit, but, but, but they, they were sort of, sort of only, only partially uh, blinded. But my point is that they didn't realize initially that deregulation wasn't going to be about deregulation. It was going to be this constructive process of building market institutions. Eventually, they figured that out, but even, which leads me to the second error they made, which is that they overestimated the benefits of, of real deregulation, right? So in, in those areas where they actually were kind of trying to pick out regulations and eliminate them, they overestimated the benefits. And again, I'm suggesting that if you have a market craft perspective, there should be no surprise here, right? Because market, markets are these holistic, right, ecosystems that, are, that involve formal regulations, um, uh, business practices, social norms, right? And so just because you tweak this, you get rid of this regulation, doesn't necessarily mean all of a sudden you're going to have efficiency benefits. Again, I could make this argument a million different ways, but I'll just try to give you one example to kind of be concrete. Right? If you deregulate a sector and government regulation is then replaced with private sector collusion, then you're not going to have a productivity increase, right? Um, because you still don't have competition. Um, so, um, and uh, my colleague across the bay, um, Takeo Hoshi, uh, uh, an excellent um, Japanese economist, has actually run some regressions, and he's coming at it from precisely the opposite angle, right? Because I'm expecting deregulation not to work. He's expecting it should work, right? And he's running these regulations, and the Japanese government is cooperating because they've got this fabulous index of regulation. Uh, both at quantitative and level of constraint. So you can actually correlate that with productivity improvements. And then to his utter disappointment, he finds there is no correlation, right? So the deregulation, right, at least according to that model, did no good whatsoever. Okay. Um, so now let's maybe talk a little bit about politics, um, uh, but just in the general sense. Um, what are the big lessons for progressives and market liberals, right? Instead of saying conservatives and labor or Republicans and Democrats, I'm going to keep this a little bit more ideological. But I'm going to argue that this argument actually has implications on both sides, right? Um, so let's start with the progressives. Here the logic is that if you think of the, the, the logic of this argument, I think it undercuts the, what I would call the crude version of a libertarian worldview, right? <coughs> In other words, if your worldview is that what we need to do is have less government and therefore we'll have more market, in my humble opinion, you're just plain wrong. All right? We'll get to a more sophisticated version in a moment. So I'm not saying that, that, that market liberals are just going to say, OK, you got me. Um, but for the progressive, right, that's your entry point. You say, well, um, markets are ne inherently need governance. right? Secondly, you argue that markets uh, that government regulation should not be compared to the free market, which doesn't exist. It should be compared to the dirty, sullied, uh, corrupt, fraud-ridden markets that actually exist. Right? Um, and my point is that this then 
gives the entry point, the logical entry point, to say, well, if markets are inherently governed, right, that the actually governed ones are not actually that well governed by the private sector, right, then that gives you um, the entry point to say, well, maybe we can do better. Maybe we can market craft better, right, because our choice is not market craft or no market craft, it's good or bad. Um, furthermore, I think it gives a, a bigger, a broader arsenal, right, uh, in other words, if we think about like what's the agenda for progressives, I'm not saying that they're they're unaware of the market craft, but I, I agenda. But I would say that there tends to be a focus on redistribution. Right? You kind of would expect that from the opposition. So those who oppose redistribution would say, "Oh, well, you just want to redistribute." But even the advocates, right, focus a lot on that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's a big piece of the puzzle. But if you're thinking about like something like inequality, right? You have to think about redistribution, but you also have to think about what my colleagues uh, Hacker and Pearson call predistribution, or I like, to, I, I like to just call it plain old distribution, right? In other words, who dealt the cards in the first place, right? And what affects those outcomes, right? It wasn't the natural market. It was a market that was governed in a particular way, right? Um, and so my point is that progressives can say, instead of saying, we dislike the market, like let's try to make it shrink it, right? And I'm not saying there are, I'm not saying everything should be marketized. There, there's a room for that too, but they should also think of it as a tool, right? If the market is not an end, it's a, if it's a tool, not an end, then it's a tool that can be used for a variety of purposes, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so the market liberals. I've already said that I think that the market craft argument does run counter to the simple version of a libertarian argument, but not to a more sophisticated market liberal argument that would say, we believe in markets, we believe in market freedom, but we realize that you need governance in order to get there, right? That this view would appreciate the necessity and the complexity of market governance, right? In other words, what I'm saying is if you're an enlightened market liberal, um, then you should, and you really believe in the most dynamic markets possible, right? The greatest level of economic freedom possible. Then instead of just saying, right, kind of simplifying things and say, well, regulation is bad, let's get rid of it. You should be doing the much harder task of trying to separate out which regulations actually impede markets and which empower them. Which regulations impede freedom, which, um, regulations sustain it, right? That's not easy, but that's what you would have to do. So I've already suggested that I think the stakes of market craft are pretty high. Um, that uh, I've said that I operate on this distinction between market governance and social regulation or social welfare. But of course that sidesteps a huge point, which is that market craft has huge welfare implications, right? I also haven't given you a how-to manual. I haven't told you, okay, well, this is how to do good market craft. I've given you an a, a not negative and a positive example, but that's as far as we've gone right now, right? Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that I would argue if you want to think about good or bad market craft, there's a, there's a prior task, right, which is to figure out what our goals are. And maybe you should say, well, in, in economics, it's always efficiency, but in the real world, is it, right? It might be equity, right? It might be innovation. It might be sustainability, right? It might be environmental protection. And I'm, I'm saying that once you figure out your goals, then you can design the market craft, right, to attain those goals. Um, that market, better market craft can deliver better public goods. Um, so the final two points I want to make are that market craft is growing as a share of what governments do. Um, and I mean that in a few senses. One easy way to think about it is if you think about sectors, right? If you think about what are the sectors that dominate the economy today? The ones I've been talking about, right? IT and finance. These are sectors that are even more dependent on good governance, right? Than if you compare it to, for example, ma manufacturing and agriculture. Now, obviously, I have to stick with the logic of my own argument, so I would say market craft is important everywhere. But I think it's also fair to say that it's more important in these sectors where governance is kind of at the heart of the whole business. And maybe the easiest way to think about that is the right? we, we are an information economy. Well, if you think about it, there is no market for information until somebody writes a law that says we have an intellectual property right, right? So that's a fabricated market, right? 
that is basically at the heart of our economy today. So we're going to, we, we, we're going to want to do that right. And right doesn't necessarily mean more, by the way, when we get to intellectual property rights. I think there's a very strong argument to be made that we're actually overprotecting, right? We're overprotecting copyright and patent. And that's impeding, right, the growth of the uh, information economy. But my point is that it's necessarily governed and that whether we do it right or not is going to be critical. Um, another way to think about this growth is in terms of policy agenda. Again, if you think, like, what are the big questions that are going to be critical, right, for governments to get right for the growth, right, and prosperity of our economies going forward? Antitrust policy, right? We've got the frightful five. I mean, they do enormous good, but they also constrain competition. Now, how are you going to balance that, right? Intellectual property rights, which I already mentioned. Financial regulation, right? We already know just how bad things can go if you don't get that right. Um, these are, so my point is that the market craft agenda is part of, uh, of the core agenda policy. Not the only agenda, but, but some of the critical issues for our future. Final point is that the free market myth, right, obscures our own agency, right? If we think of markets as natural, then we forget that we made them. And we can craft better markets, but to do so, we have to recognize that they're constructs, not natural phenomena that flourish without government. So we're not limited to a choice between leaving, and again, notice the language, between leaving things to the market or stifling them with regulation. We can craft governance to empower markets and to direct them toward the public good, and we should. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much for that very thoughtful tour of uh, what is a very uh, uh, thoughtful book. And so we're going to open this up for questions in a moment, uh, but I will exercise my prerogative <laughs> as moderator and ask the first question as the audience uh, prepares for their questions. And I, I, as I was thinking through your argument, I said, well, if Milton Friedman were here, what would Milton Friedman say? So as a, as a good economist, I'm going to channel my inner Milton Friedman and say, um, so Milton Friedman raised two uh, arguments to defend uh, what you would call the free market paradigm or the liberal market paradigm. And, and the first was the problem of what we've started to call the problem of agency, which I'm going to hold aside for the purposes of this question. And the second was what he called the problem of information, which is that when it comes to designing the rules of the game, sometimes we just don't know. We don't know what the answers are. And it is cheaper from the perspective of social welfare to therefore delegate that to private interests than to have governments do it because if governments do it and fail, then it takes the whole economy down with it. Whereas if a few businesses try something and they fail, then you know, that problem is, is, is relatively contained. So if, if we were to sort of tackle this information problem in the context of the market craft thesis, how would we respond to that criticism? that it's actually cheaper to let this sort of market crafting happen in the private sector. Um, I would refer them to Romano on that one. Um, no. Um, so first of all, when I say market craft, um, I include private governance. right? So it includes both the government regulation and private sector governance in my concept of the term. And as I suggested earlier, that's precisely why I use the word market governance, is to include both public and private, as opposed to the word regulation, which tends to mean just the government. So in terms of my conception, I think of it in terms of both. Now, in terms of my choice of title, actually, my first idea about the subtitle was to have how um, governments, firms, and individuals make markets work which would be much more accurate, but it would have diluted the message, right? And you, you, know, you kind of got to pick your battles, right? So I, I, I said, well, no, let's not, uh, let's not be too cowardly about this. Because uh, I do think that's how it actually, the, the reality is it's, it, it's both, right? But I did want to make the point uh, 
that there's a, a certain core that the government has to do, right? Um, for some, pretty, you know, this part I don't think is that tricky, right? For some obvious reasons, right? Which is um, that the government has the ability to enforce in a way that private actors don't, right? Um, and that sometimes when you have delegation, right, to private sector actors, it, it, it builds on the back of the right, ultimate force of the state. So the force of the state is, right? There's also scale issues, right? That, that governance can deal with issues like um, moderating risks, right? Sometimes it's gotta be something, the scale of the government in order to govern that um, effectively. Um, so I think that there's a certain core, and I mean another way to make this the same point, which is kind of obvious but important, is that a lot of, uh, of, of governance rests on law, right? And so law means government. So again, my point is that governance is holistic. It includes private governance as well as public governance. Um, but it all rests on a kind of a, of, a, of a core of functions that government has to provide. Um, now, in terms of the marginal choices, that gets trickier, right? And, and as you know, um, there's all kinds of things. You can talk about information differences, right? Um, although sometimes I think those are exaggerated because obviously public officials can be pretty well educated. Um, and uh, and they, you know, they, can, they can figure out a lot of things. Um, uh, and you can also, some people would argue, well, the government is much more susceptible, for example, to rent seeking, right? Um, I would argue not necessarily, right? I mean, that you, I mean you can have financial um, institutions that are basically seeking to rip off their customers. They can either do it directly or they can do it by lobbying the government to it. So, right, you know, so, so you can have um, rent seeking both in, the, in private governance or in public governance. Um, but those, you know, those are serious things that have to be, when we get down into the weeds, those are important choices and sometimes you will favor private sector. Fantastic. Let's take some questions from the audience. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and then just state in one sentence who you are before you ask your question. So we've got a couple questions uh, right there in the back. Let's start there. Hello, my name is Luca. I'm getting my master's here. Um, and I just had a question about how exactly is your argument different from the suggestions from basic economic theory, which says that government intervention is justified in cases of market failure, including monopolies, information asymmetries, um, and so on and so forth. It seems that you're sort of just de justifying government intervention in those cases exclusively. And, or do you suggest that there's also room for state intervention in price setting and so on, which is sort of counter economic theory? Okay, so let's take, the, uh, we'll t take two or three questions at a time. So right next, yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eleanor. I'm a postdoc here at Vavatnik. Um, my question was around geographical scale. Most of the examples you used were from country level examples. Um, we've got Brexit on the brain. Uh, a lot of the resistance was around uh, EU overburdened kind of regulation. And I wondered whether you think that governance is something that only state can do or whether we can think at different geographical scales for market craft. Okay, and we'll take uh, Aaron right there. Yeah. Um, thanks. thanks very much for, for that presentation. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the PhD students here at the Blavatnik School. Um, I had a question that had two parts, actually. One was around the role that Market Craft might have in helping us understand the nature of business and government collaboration. Because theoretically, you could have that collaboration lead to wonderful effects, right, uh, where there is a genuine collaboration around complex issues which can be understood better because of conscious market craft between governance and, and, and private governance, as you described. But you also have risks of capture and, and risks of, of rent-seeking between and, and mutual collusion between the government and, and businesses. And I was curious whether your framework has ways of helping us disentangle that and figure out between those options which are more likely in which settings. Uh, the other question is, is around whether you think market craft and state craft are all that we need, or do we actually need other things to help us make good public policy as well? I'm thinking about Eleanor Ostrom's work uh, on the role of communities and people, and, and what I'm wondering is even if we get market craft right, 
would we then also need a certain amount of community craft to involve publics in the kinds of deliberation that she suggests that we, we should have? Fantastic. So, Steve, you can take those and... Ooh. Yeah. Um, great questions, um, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can do them all justice. Um, the first question, um, you know, there's kind of different ways to think about it, but um, I actually did get challenged along these lines from my economist colleagues, so I somewhat anticipated this. Um, my chapter two, in a sense, is, 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 could be interpreted. I don't use the language of market failure and response, but it could be interpreted that way. Basically, I'm saying, why do we need governance in each of these areas? And I go through each of them. But I, you know, if somebody said, well, that's kind of like saying you know, market failure and market, you know, and government response. Um, I would say, yeah, that's right. Um, so I think, uh, but then in chapter five, I come back and, and critique the economists a bit. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, well, to, to one piece of your quote question, I would, I, I'm not saying you, they should uh, necessarily, that government should intervene in ways that would distort prices, right? I'm more, I, I, so I think I'm more within the, the realm of economic thinking broadly defined in terms of trying to think about what, what creates competition, what creates more deeper and, and wider markets. Um, but to get your point about government failure, I, I come back and I critique this in the, in the following way. Um, so I'm not saying that what I'm, what I'm arguing is necessarily inconsistent with basic economic understanding, but I am saying that um, I find uh, some limitations um, to the way that economists conventionally look at this. And one way to think about it is that, that the, the framework of, of market failure um, generates a, a kind of a whack-a-mole approach to policy. What I mean by whack-a-mole is the game where you know the, the, the mole sticks up and you, you, you whack it. Um, uh, point being, you know, that it, it starts from, in other words, it starts from the assumption of, of, of perfect markets, and then you say, okay, well, this one's imperfect in this way. Okay, we've got to solve that problem. Does that make sense? Um, okay, this one's imperfect in that way. We've got to solve it in this way. I'm saying that market um, construction is a kind of a, a broader and more, more holistic thing, and maybe you could go and, 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 and go through each piece and kind of try to figure out what the market failure is. Um, but I think that um, a, a more holistic kind of uh, framework is more effective in understanding the, the issues of, of market governance. The other critique I might make, again, of a standard ec economic analysis would be that, it, it uh, again, it doesn't, and maybe it relates to one of the later questions, it's, it, they don't tend to be as inclusive in terms of their understanding of the, of the multitude of kinds of institutions and social norms and practices that structure real world uh, market governance. Um, and so as I begin the book, I say, well, we all agree that markets are institutions, right? Um, so there's nobody who says that there's no governance. It, it's, it's, but, it, but there are differences, I think, analytically in terms of the range of institutions that they study. If we go, and again, you know, economics has, has moved in all kinds of f fabulous directions. So, uh, you, know, I don't, uh, you know, in terms of behavioral economics, in terms of market design subfield, in terms of institutional economics. But to summarize crudely, you know, if you go from standard economics to institutional economics to economic sociology, you're going towards a, a kind of a broader conception of the range of different institutions that structure real world markets. Um, so, oh, second question was geographical scale. That point I will very readily concede. Um, you know, for, I'm focusing on the national level. I think that um, uh, it's a little easier to do that when you're looking at the US and Japan than when you're looking at Europe. I actually initially wanted, I came, I, when I started thinking about this book, I came to Europe first and I wanted to do Europe. And then I realized I would still be writing the book now. Right? Um, not just because it would add a third case, but because it's a two dimensional case, right? And that all of these areas are areas in which the European Union plays a strong role. I mean, you could pick certain topics where you could pretend like, you know, member states were, you know, autonomous entities. This is not one of them. Um, so, uh, so I can see the point. Um, I mean, I can imagine another book that would look at the global level 
but it's true that there's you know even if we're talking about the United States, there's no country that just makes that, that just governs the markets by itself without you know outside negotiations. So that's obviously ob obviously true, but within that environment, um, policymakers have to do the best they can, right? So maybe to the extent that the external factor is a constraint, then right then then, then you have to write that into your your policy analysis, right? And say, well, given we can't do this, what can we do? Um, so th third, um, I'm not sure if I properly noted all the pieces of the uh, of the argument, but I, I particularly like the final point about community. Um, so again, when I think about market craft, um, and I, I, you know, I have only myself to blame for this because I've been talking about governments in my presentation, but I very much conceive it uh, as, as governments and uh, private associations, private firms, right, is the agglomeration of all of those things. And in the typology that I create, I have uh, laws and regulations, uh, then business practices and standards, and then social norms and beliefs, right? So you go from formal to informal, um, from public to private, from binding to non-binding. Um, you know, all of this is part of governance. Now, as you go away from the government to the more the social norms end, right, or the societal part, crafting becomes harder, right? And so I've, you know, again, I have to concede that point, right? Um, I don't think it's impossible, right? It's, you know, because obviously we, you know, Societies are made up of people too, but it's much harder for a, for a planner to say, okay, well, we want to do that. Um, having said that, Japan is an interesting case because I think Japan is a case where the government does that more consciously than perhaps in the United States or UK. Um, I, uh, one of my mentors uh, wrote a book about Japan called Molding Japanese Minds, um, which was about how the government, uh, basic, so this is Sheldon Guerin, uh, how the government created the very high savings rates in the post-war era through conscious campaigns, right? So they were, and, and they were, so they were both trying to change the way people think, right, to make them save, not spend. And it was also trying to change the way they're organized society, like right? to work through neighborhood associations and housewives associations, right, to kind of, so to, you know, to create a certain kind of civil society. Now, obviously, that's not easy. I'm not saying it was entirely successful. But I'm just saying that even the things that we might think are most remote from the possibility of market craft, it's not impossible, although I would certainly agree that it was complicated. Now, did I miss an early part of that question? I think the first part of it was about business government collaboration and um, you know, when that might lead to some form of capture and when it might actually work yeah. successfully. So obviously, yes, it, it, it could be successful or it could be captured, right? The tricky question is when and why. Um, I think, I'll, you know, a lot of it has to do with the autonomy of this and the capacity of the state, right? Um, and again, I think of Japan because that's the country I know the best. Um, but. Uh, the Japanese, and, and uh, Peter Evans has this book on embedded autonomy, which I think kind of gets at your question, right? Because what he's saying is that, that the most successful developmental states in the world are both embedded in society, like, and, and, and very much in the way you're thinking about, through these government uh, business networks, and yet they're autonomous, which sounds like a contradiction, right? It sounds like a contradiction, right? Because if they're that embedded, they must be captured, right? But he's saying the most successful actually pull it off. Right? They're both embedded and captured, which I think, if you think about it conceptually, at least is, is theoretically possible. Right? And that's, again, where I, you know, I think there's Japanese cases where I can imagine that it is true. For instance, if you take MITI, right, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, its claim to fame, it actually has relatively uh, little jurisdiction. That's a separate issue. But its claim to fame is its relationship with industry. Right? That's, that's, that's its power. Its power is its ties to industry. So you would think, well, wouldn't that just naturally lead to just it being captured by an industry? And I do think that, that there's no such thing as pure autonomy. There's a price. You know, if, if you're going to be that close, there is some price. You know, you're going to have to at least listen to these people. Right? But uh, to get to your question, one of, the, one of the reasons why I think they weren't totally captured, career civil service, high prestige, high training, and the ability to play the players off of each other. Right? So in other words, if we're all in one room, at the same time, 
then you're more susceptible to capture. But if you're, if you're kind of keeping this hub, hub and spoke, like keeping yourself at the center of the network and playing the industry players off of each other, I think that's one of the ways that they manage to have both that closeness without succumbing to total capture. Fantastic. Let's take some more questions. So we've got one right here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Shi Hong, uh, MPP student at Brumatic School. My question is, uh, you made the point clear that it's important to know what kind of regulation will impede uh, the, con uh, the, the market and what kind of regulations will empower the, the market. Uh, but the problem is when and how can you know your regulation will impede or empower the market. In reality, more often uh, the government can find out this after this regulation failed and create more problems. But is there, is this a case that, this is a case that the government can only learn the lessons after the, the regulation failed and then take another round of reform. That's how all the, a lot of governments are always taking several rounds of reforms. They're going back from uh, force and back. And uh, is there any tool or any um, principles that can help the government to make it that some, a, a better regulation in advance rather than to take measures to correct it all the time. Fantastic. Uh, then there was a question in the back there, Jolie. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm a PhD student at the School of Geography or the Environmental Change Institute more precisely, and I'm studying electricity market reform. Um, and also uh, the changes that are happening right now in the energy sector. Um, and I have two questions. So first of all, um, you said, you made reference to the fact that before going about designing a market, um, you should become aware of, or one should become aware of one's goals, public interest mm -hmm. goals, basically. Um, and I would like you to um, say something about the trade-offs that often exist between several goals, um, also between several stakeholders that you're invariably trying to um, align interests in a society. Um, secondly, my question is, um, is there kind of an argument for methodologically, or I guess academically, looking at specific sectors and specific places and, and really taking a, not necessarily, I wouldn't call it geof geographical approach, but um, kind of a, a place and space specific, context specific approach to understanding what the correct market craft is in which situation. So not even just one sector, you know, the telecom sector or the electricity sector all over the world, but actually kind of very specific. Um, yeah, so those are the two questions. Um, and yeah, Fantastic. leave it there for Let's now. Take one more, um, maybe over there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Professor. Um, listening to your presentation, I sort of tempted to to ask a rhetoric question, for instance. Sir, you have um, to introduce yourself as well. Uh, sorry, my name is Abdul Fatal, an MPP student at the Blavatnik. Um, I was sort of tempted to ask a rhetoric question that um, what would be the objective for government to promote market development. And the reason why I ask it, in, in Ghana, for, for instance, I mean, service sector has, I mean, has been dominating over the past few years, and which is largely, I mean, telecom and then the banking. And most of these are owned by foreign institutions. The question I want to ask is, how can we better craft market and at the same time ensure retention of the returns of these institutions in the domestic economy. The, the reason is if, if you look at some of these activities, I mean, moving away those funds, it puts, continuously put pressure on the domestic currency, which in a way affect the economy as well. And then also, how can the market craft model, uh, how can developing countries, for instance, especially lower middle income countries, fit in the market craft model? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.
Steve. Fantastic questions and very challenging. Um, let's see. Oh, when and how um, does the market know whether um, regulation is, is enhancing the market or detracting from it? So I'm going to concede the basic point outright, which, say, which is to say there's a lot of muddiness, but try to give you a couple practical um, thoughts, hopefully. One is that at, at the first stage, right, at later stages, it gets much more muddier. But at, a kind of, at, the, at the first stage, it's actually not that complicated in, this, in the following sense. Certain regulations are pro-competitive, and certain regulations are kind of, by definition, anti-competitive, right? So we had the example of price and entry controls, right, earlier. Those are anti-competitive, right? So those are, so you'd want to get rid of them, right? If you, if you believe in markets, you want to get, basically, and what I'm saying is, if you, if, if you believe in the power of markets, then you want to eliminate anti-competitive reg regulation, and you want to enhance pro-competitive regulation, right? Either regulation that directly spurs, enhances, whatever, competition, or sustains it, right, in the sense of an accounting regulation that isn't creating competition itself, but it's a prerequisite for the development of a certain kind of market. Does that make sense? Right, so that's kind of like a first stage where you can, you know, you can kind of put things into boxes. Um, I'm guessing that some of the things you're thinking about are more what you might call industrial policy, and that's actually not, that's beyond, the, I'm not saying you couldn't, you couldn't lump it together with market craft, but that's not, that's not the core of my market craft agenda. My core of my market is just basic market governance, right? How are, you, how, are you, how are you going to set the rules for the market? And what I'm basically saying is in our modern economy, that's incredibly complicated and it's incredibly important. And you, you have to think about that as a, as a core function rather than, and maybe this is the danger of the market failure view, right? Even though conceptually I understand it, right? Is to say, rather than say, okay, in case of doubt, let the markets decide, right? What I'm saying is if you're letting the markets decide, you're letting, you know, it, it's, it doesn't mean it's ungoverned. It means it's governed by somebody, but not necessarily well, right? Um, so I guess that's the best thing I could do for, you, for your question is to say that you, you, you just kind of start with principles, right? Um, and work your way from there, and I'm, and I'm admitting that it, you know, as you got in finer, finer group, it would get, um, um, it would get muddier. Um, so, oh, what are the trade-offs? You know, that's a great question, and then there's different ways to interpret it. Um, so let me give you a couple of them. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, if we're thinking about like policy goals, right? First, you have to think about whether the trade-offs, whether there really are trade-offs, right? right? In other words, I mean, typically we tend to think of, of, of efficiency versus equity, right? Um, and, I, you know, I think that should be a question, not an answer, right? Um, and, 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 and that's where market craft or market governance because they're very important. Because if you say that the relationship between those two could be conflictual or complementary, then, then you want to start thinking about a market governance in which they would be more complementary. Does that make sense? Um, so that, that in a sense would be part of what you're trying to do, right? Is to, is, is it instead of, instead of to succumb to that trade-off, right, to diminish it. Um, a very different way to interpret what you mean by that question is just to think about in terms of, of policy cleavages, which is what I, which I do get into at, at great length um, in the second chapter, because as you think about each of these issue areas, right, there are, um, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to argue in that chapter is that we tend to frame policy debates in terms of government versus market, but they're actually rarely about that, right? Um, they're about something substantive, and they're about something um, political, right? So if we just take the telecoms example, right? Um, the substantive would be how do we understand um, the nature of the investment that the incumbent has made in the infrastructure, right? Um, and how this, should they be compensated if they're not, right? The political part is, is this regulation going to be pro-incumbent or is it going to be pro-competitor? That's the, and my point is, that's the core trade-off or cleavage, right? And we can talk about government versus market, and, when, and the actors will do that to deceive you, right, to, um, in order to make their own case. But we as analysts have to say, okay, strip it down and say, what are we really talking about? We're not really talking about government versus market. We're really not talking about constraint versus freedom. We're talking about, are we going to make life easier for the incumbent or are we going to make life easier for the challengers, right? Um, and so my point is, and, and, and I won't go into every single I issue, but you can kind of do that kind of analysis for all of these. Um, 
sectors and places. I think, I mean, that's certainly how I work. I, my own research is always grounded in a place and often, and typically in a sector, often many places and many sectors. So I'm comparing sectors and countries. Um, and I find that incredibly useful, both as an analyst, because the comparison gives you leverage, but also in concrete terms, because each, each case is kind of different. But if we're thinking about it in terms of policy analysis, I think that understanding the context is absolutely critical, right? Because let's imagine we deregulate a sector, right? In other words, that there were some, there were price and entry controls, and we eliminate those. And, and our um, economic advisor says, if you eliminate these controls, you will have productivity benefits because you're going from collusion to competition, right? And in country A, they might be right, and in country B, they're wrong, right? Why? Because in country A, there's a certain right, it's, it's what, you know, in the absence of that regulation, what type of private governance and what type of social behavior is going to evolve, right? And, and I typically would think about US and Japan, right? So if you de formally deregulate a sector in Japan, maybe nothing will happen, right? Because maybe the sector, uh, the players within that sector understand each other enough that they don't even have to collude, they just wink, don't change prices, nothing happened, right? You just deregulate it. So my point is that if you're trying to understand um, the impact of a policy, you have to know the, na the national or sectoral context. If you're trying to understand the politics, you also have to, because the politics might differ depending on the social composition, because the players that might say, say that. F for example, the Japanese industry might not oppose it, right? And so if you're a naive political analyst, you say, oh, why, they're so enlightened, right? In, J in Japan, they don't even oppose uh, this liberalization of their market, right? Whereas these, these Americans are fighting, lobbying, right? Well, maybe that's because the Americans are corrupt and the Japanese are enlightened, or maybe it's because they know it's not gonna make any difference anyway. Right? But you wouldn't have understood that politics without understanding the, the social context. Um, we had one more, right? Um, ah, so I'm obviously not an expert on the developing world, but when I teach the political economy and development, um, I've been very powerfully influenced by an article by my colleague, which is now several decades old. Her name is Kiran Chowdhury. Um, and and, and she worked on, I think, a question that's very much related to your question, which is how do you balance the um, twin, right? if you basically accept this, this, this argument that markets have to be developed, the twin challenges of market development and state development, right? Um, and basically she argues, I think kind of along the lines of your question, that there's a tension between the two, right? That if you, even, even if you were being, developing them not in a Washington consensus way, but in the kind of the way I'm describing, where you're trying to build up a capacity, if you're trying to build up the administrative capacity to actually have functioning markets, but at the same time you're trying to create an, a, an autonomous nation state, right, with a certain bureaucratic capacity, Anyway, long story short, um, she recognizes that tension, and, and, and I'm not sure I would go there, but I'll just tell you where she goes with it. She says you, uh, many developing countries are going to have to prioritize the political and bureaucratic, you know, in terms of a stage, right? Uh, in other words, you've got to do that first, and then you can worry about building, you know, uh, a, a regulatory capacity that could monitor that kind of level of whatever, financial market, um, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm, I, if I were going to answer the question myself, I might answer it slightly differently because I've been studying the Japanese bureaucracy for 30 years, and so I, I think there's something to a, you know, an elite civil service, right? So that that would, you know, that once you have that, then it can, and I understand you're also talking about the relationship to the outside, and she, and she very much does in her article, because when she's saying the limits uh, of, of, the, of the nation state, it's also, it's often because there's a kind of a dependent relationship, right? So how do you, how do you, if not sever that, how do you contain it, right? So that you can actually govern markets in a way that you think is good for your country, not for foreign capital, right? Um, so, so it's a tension, but I think that again, you know, state capacity and, and building up, you know, that's another reason why I call it, you know, market craft is because I do think administrative capacity is a, is a huge part of this, right? And, and that involves autonomy as well as, you know, smart government officials. Okay, we're quickly running out of time, so let's do one more question. And, and since we're here in a new school of government, I'm going to ask you, um, what is the one thing we can do in designing the policy, the 
curriculum here at the, in the master's in public policy degree uh, to build this art of market craft? Well, I don't know if this is a good answer or not, but the, uh, I'm just, you know, because I would have to probably think about it further. But I'll tell you what, you know, what's happened to me is that the more and more I've studied market governance, the less and less of a political scientist I've become. Um, and I think that's because um, I've learned so much from these other disciplines. I mean, in my case, um, especially economic sociology and institutional economics. Now, all that may, this may sound very esoteric, but I actually think that when you get um, the kinds of issues we're talking about are ones where there are insights from multiple disciplines. Um, so, so I, right, I can imagine, and I don't know, I'm sure there are things like this already being taught, but, uh, but, but kind of a holistic look at markets that would take uh, the kind of more uh, core economics viewpoint very seriously, not dismiss it, right? But also look at how, you know, an economic sociologist would understand the market and political scientist and a more institutional economist. And then obviously take those um, conceptual frameworks and go to policy prescriptions. Um, I mean, in my own teaching, obviously, since I'm not primarily teaching policy, I go from theory to countries, right? Um, but I don't see why you couldn't do the same thing um, for market craft with a very with a with with kind of a pretty specific policy output as the goal, but starting at a pretty theoretical level and really playing off the tension between these theoretical perspectives. I think is you know is, is, is both it's healthy, um, and I think it's it's something that really. Um, allows you to push the, your thinking about something to a higher level. Fantastic. Professor Steve Vogel, thank you so much for visiting the Blavatnik School. The book is Market Crafts, How Governments Make Markets Work. Again, there are some copies, limited copies available here for purchase, but there are also flyers for those of you who'd like to buy it uh, offline. Thank you so much. Thank you. The books are at uh, author's discount, which is 19 pounds. Rock bottom. I'll take your uh, mic. Uh,